James chapter 6. We begin reading in just a moment in verse number 10 and we continue our series on the armor of God. We will be specifically looking at verse number 15, but in order to get the full gist of what the Lord is saying here, let's begin with verse number 10. Let's stand together as we read and honor the Lord. Ephesians chapter 6, beginning with the 10th verse. Hang on a minute. There. Beginning with the 10th verse, this is what the Bible says. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the schemes, the trickery of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God. You may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet, preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Father, we thank you and wait now expectantly upon you to move in our midst. Have your will and way in everything that is said and done. We thank you for what has been accomplished thus far. Lead us as only you know how because, Father, we need to follow your direction <coughs> and your leadership and your guidance. We wait now upon you and we praise you and thank you for what you're about to do in the name of Christ our Savior. Amen. Thank you. You be seated. Let me begin this morning by telling you that of all of the fascinating creatures that Almighty God has ever made upon this earth, the eagle is one of the most fascinating of all. Now, I have preached other sermons. I've dealt with this in Bible study, especially when we were in uh, Isaiah chapter 40 and we talked about uh, soaring with eagles and that kind of thing. Made some remarkable statements about a remarkable bird. But in conjunction with our focus today, I want to share something with you that maybe you don't know, an interesting aspect of the eagle that uh, at least a portion of it I've never shared with you to this point. The eagle has an innate ability that was given it by God to be able to sense when a storm is approaching the area in which it resides. Now there are other animals that have that innate sense as well. You may have a, a dog that stays in the house that when a storm is approaching may get somewhat uh, uh, disturbed or may crawl up under the bed or up under the couch or whatever the case may be because he or she is aware of the fact that there's something that is brewing on the outside and so they are finding a place of shelter and a place of protection. The eagle is that way, but there is a vast difference between the eagle and basically every other creature that God has made. And that is this. While chickens will run for cover, while turkeys will run for cover, while cats and dogs may run for cover, the eagle will actually climb or jump or maybe even fly to a higher place whether that be a tree, it be a rock, it be a ledge, whatever the case might be, in order that the eagle will be prepared when the storm that is approaching actually gets to where the eagle is. Now not only does the eagle go to a higher place, 
in order to get prepared. But the eagle literally locks its wings in place and turns its body so that the, the back side of the eagle is facing the direction from which the storm is coming in order that it might be able to, to know which way the wind is blowing. It locks its wings in place. It will turn itself to, to back into the wind, so to speak, and it waits expectantly for the storm to come and for the winds to begin to blow because when that takes place, when that storm arrives and when those currents begin to move and when those winds begin to pick up, because the eagle is prepared, because the eagle has its wings locked, because it is able to catch the, the brewing storm and the currents that will be coming off of that storm, because of those locked wings, it is able to soar high above and over the storm that everything down on the ground is having to go through and deal with. Follow me carefully here. The eagle is in the storm, but he's not adversely affected by the storm. Okay? He's in the storm, but he's not adversely affected by the storm because he has made proper preparation because his wings are locked and that allows him to soar above and over the storm that might be raging below him. Now there are several things that literally need to jump out at us here that we need to understand. The first of which is this. And if you don't know this, it's simply because you haven't lived long enough to experience it. But point number one that you need to understand is this. You don't have to go around searching for the storms of life. You just keep living life and the storms will find you. Amen? Amen. You don't have to go looking for the storm. You live long enough, the storm will come one day knocking on your door. Now we have people who are uh, storm chasers and hurricane hunters, and at the appropriate time of the year, they will actually go out looking to try to find the, the hurricane and, and be able to measure its wind velocity and its size and, and its strength and its power and all those kind of things. We have storm chasers that will go out into the Midwest, into quote unquote Tornado Alley and, and those surrounding areas, and they will go out there with the intent and with the purpose of chasing those storms and trying to learn more about them so that they might be able to better predict in order that they might be able to protect those of us that might be in the path of those storms. So my point is, when it comes to, to storms of nature, People have to go out and find those and chase those down. But when it comes to the storms of life, you just need to live. You don't have to go chase them. They'll chase you. You don't have to go find them. They'll track you down. Now sometimes it might be something small. Sometimes it might be something large. Again, I think it's all a matter of perspective. I've had people say to me before when somebody was going to have surgery, they'll, they'll ask me, they'll say, well, Pastor, is it is it minor surgery or is it major surgery? Well, I guess it's all a matter of perspective because if they're operating on you, to me it's minor, but if they're operating on me, it's major. <laughs> right? Isn't that true? I mean, it might be a heart transplant, but I can look at it if it's you, and I can say, "Oh, that's mine," or you know. But if they're, you know, but if they're taking out my gallbladder, it's major if it's mine. So it's all a matter of perspective, and we need to understand that sometimes the storms of life may be somewhat small, and they may not last but just twenty-four hours. It might come in and it might blow through real quickly and just about the time that you are getting ready to deal with it, it's gone. 
then sometimes it's like one of these slow moving storm systems that just comes and just hangs around and just dumps rain and dumps rain and dumps rain and dumps rain and you're thinking when in the world is this thing going to pass through and pass That's why the Lord Jesus Christ in John 16, 33 said this. Listen. He said, in the world you shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Now understand what he said and understand what he did. He said, in this world. In other words, in this life you will have tribulation. <coughs> okay? In other words, if you are above ground and breathing, at some point in time you're going to have trials and troubles and tribulations. They come with the territory. We live in a fallen world. There is sin that is rampant among us. And because of that, there is and there will be trials and struggles and stresses and strains and tribulations and storms. Jesus didn't say in this world you might have or you could have or it's possible that you will have. He said you will. You shall have tribulation. Now that would be one of the most uh, sad, one of the most worrisome, one of the most bothersome verses of Scripture in the Bible if it ended with a period after Jesus said, in this world you shall have tribulation. If he had just said, in this world you shall have tribulation, period, and then went on to something else, we truly would be up the proverbial creek without a paddle. But notice that that's not where he, he stopped. As a matter of fact, there's not a period there. There's a semicolon. And a semicolon means there's a pause, but there's something else that's coming. So Jesus said, in this world you shall have tribulation. Pause. But be of good cheer, because I've already overcome the world. And the idea here that is implied is this. Listen carefully. Because I have overcome the world and because I am getting ready to live in you, you too can overcome the world. And that's good news in the day and time in which we live. Because the culture that we live in today is infested with evil. I was appalled. I was absolutely appalled yesterday. We had several different things going on. Sassy had a couple of ball games and uh, we had a uh, 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 birthday get together for Josh. And so it was late yesterday afternoon when I got on uh, Facebook. And when I got on Facebook, one of the first things that popped up on my screen uh, was Supreme Court Justice Anton Scalia and the fact that he had passed away. Now, Anton Scalia was uh, nominated by President Ronald Reagan and is what has been one of the most brilliant jurists to have ever served on the Supreme Court. Magnificent mind. Brilliant, brilliant jurist. But because he was a conservative, because he stood for what is right, some of the comments being made by the liberals, by Hollywood, by some of the comedians and whatnot were not only scandalous but just absolutely nasty. I read probably 25 just, just briefly kind of running down through them and if I saw the F word once 
I probably saw it at least 50 times. And people were saying, I hope he rots in hell. I'm sure the devil has shown him his particular corner of hell that he's going to occupy. I mean, just ugly, ugly, ugly stuff. We live in a world today that is infested and, and corrupted by evil and wickedness everywhere. All you have to do is go to the movies, turn on the television, listen to the radio, and you can see that we live in a very, very evil and corrupt day and society. The flesh of humanity is permeated and saturated with sin today. And yet, as a child of God, you and I have an advantage. <coughs> like the eagle, when you know the storm is coming, and let's be honest, sometimes we know when a storm's coming, you can just kind of sense it, and you know trouble brewing. Really. And you know it, it's coming. And then sometimes it's like this flash storm and it hits you right out of nowhere and you know, you're know you in the middle of it. But you and I have an advantage because we know whether it be something suddenly that happens or something that is coming from a distance that we can see, you and I know that we can prepare ourselves in advance. We, we don't lock our wings, but we can lock into some, into some things that will help to bring security and peace in the midst of the storm that we are involved in. So when the winds of life begin to pursue you, when the winds of life begin to increase and the whirlwind is blowing around you, rather than it sucking you under and pulling you down, you've got something that will securely set you and your life to an extent that you can be like the eagle and you can sail above it and you can even benefit from it. Now I know that sounds impossible, but follow me and you'll understand in here in just a moment. Look back in a moment for a verse, at verse number 15 of Ephesians 6 that I called your attention to a few minutes ago. This is the next piece of armor that the Apostle Paul tells us that we are to put on. He says, And having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now again, this is one of those things like I told you last week. This is one of those things that we are to put on and we are to continually wear all the time. This is a part, if you were here last week or if you watched on YouTube, this is a part of the Christian uniform, so to speak. He doesn't say put it on. He says having shod. In other words, it should have already taken place. And it should be a continual thing. Not a one time only. Okay? Having shod your feet. And he says to shod your feet with what? Preparation of the gospel of peace. Hear me carefully when I tell you this. Because you need to know this. We all need to know. You and I cannot survive this world. We cannot survive this life without God's peace. Okay? We can't do that. We will not be able to survive without God's peace. Like the wings of that eagle, we've got to lock God's peace into place in our lives. This is a touchy subject. And let me try to be tender and compassionate while at the same time being truthful. <coughs> this is why. Well, let me let me back up and say it another way. 
when people do not have God's peace in their life. This is why so many people commit suicide. Okay? I don't like to have to say that, but it's true. Because they, they, get, they get to the point where they feel like they are at the end of their road. And they're out of answers. They're out of solutions. They've tried everything they know to try. And nothing has worked. And so they get to the point of thinking, this is useless. I'm not, I don't have any peace. I'm not going to be able to find any peace. I'm not going to be able to get a hold of any peace. And so I just, I'm going to end it. You cannot survive without the peace of God in your heart. And notice, I said the peace of God. That's P-E-A-C-E. -E. I did not say that you have to have a peace, P-I-E-C-E -E, of God in your heart. That's again one of the reasons that so many people have problems <clears throat> They don't want the P-E-A-C-E. -E, they just want a P-I-E-C-E -E of God. Just a sliver. Just a, you know, just a, just a portion. I, I, I want to have a, a part of Him and I want Him to have a part of me. But in order for you to have the P-E-A-C-E -E of God, you've got to give Him all of you and you've got to be willing to take all of Him. Amen. Okay? Without the peace of God in our hearts, we will not be able to survive. Why do you say that? Simply because of this. The enemy wants you to be peaceless. The enemy wants you to be peaceless or without peace. Listen, he wants you to be worried. He wants you to be stressed. He wants you to be burdened down. He wants you to be anxious. He wants you to be uh, haunted by the regrets of yesterday and last year and earlier in your life. He wants you to regret your past and to be haunted by the things that you used to do and the places you used to go and the people you used to hang around with. He wants you to carry those burdens all the way to the grave. And He wants you to live in contention and in worry and strife and stress with your life all balled up in a knot. He wants you to get to the point to where you believe that because certain things have happened to you in your past, that that causes certain things to <coughs> be able to happen for you in your future. In other words, you'll always be hamstrung by your past. That's one of the wonderful things about being a child of God. You can bring your past. Listen, you can bring your past to the cross. You can bring your past to the cross and you can leave it there. And you can get up and walk away. And when you get up and walk away, you walk away in freedom because you've left your past. And let's be honest. I'll lift my hand first, but let's be honest. There's not a one of us in here that does not have a past. Okay. So I can't point fingers, and neither can you. You remember the woman taken in adultery in John chapter 8? And the men were all standing there with a rock. And they said, the law says that legally we can stone her to death. What do you think? Jesus said, basically, I'm paraphrasing here, but Jesus basically said, I totally agree. So whichever one of you is without sin, you go ahead and throw the first rock and hit her. And the Bible says, that they all began to step back and step away and leave from the eldest even unto the youngest. 
The Bible doesn't say this, but by implication, if you'll listen close, when you read that passage of Scripture, if you'll listen closely enough, if you get somewhere really, really quiet, and you'll listen closely enough, you'll hear those rocks thudding on the ground when those clenched hands opened up and those men dropped those rocks because they realized I'm just as guilty as she is. I'm just as guilty as she is. Maybe they hadn't committed adultery, but they had sinned there. And remember, Jesus didn't say which one, whichever one of you hadn't committed adultery, let him throw the first rock. He said, he who is without sin. And they realized, not me. And then you can hear them. And it's interesting that the Bible says that they went away from the eldest to the least you know why the oldest went first? He was the oldest. He had the most sin in his life. I guess I need to leave here. So he he backed out first. Listen. Your enemy. I got a bunch of I got a bunch of D words here. Okay, start with the letter D. Because it's easy to remember these things when they all start with the same letter. But here's where your enemy wants you. Okay? He wants you down. He wants you discouraged. He wants you distracted. He wants you depressed. And he wants you defeated. Okay? Down, discouraged, distracted, depressed, and defeated. He wants it to be the point that you can't sleep at night. He wants it to be the point that you can't function properly during the day. He wants your stress level and your anxiety level to be so high that you just want to give up and quit. And if you remember the... And I'm dating myself here, but that's all right. I, uh, any of you ever remember the uh, song by Frank Sinatra called That's Life? And, and at the end of that thing, he says uh, something like, and, and if it doesn't get any better, he said, I think I'll just wrap myself up in, in a big ball and just die. And I thought, well, hallelujah. Isn't that just a great, isn't that just a great concept? If I can't get it right, I'll just fall up and die somewhere. That's exactly what Satan wants you to think. And what you do, he wants turmoil and anxiety and confusion to be the watchwords by which you and I live our lives. He doesn't want you to be marked by peace or by unity, but by discord and division and dissension. You see, Satan knows something that maybe you don't. Hear me carefully. Satan knows that where there is no peace, there is also no victory. <clears throat> if you're writing things down, you need to write that down. If you're not writing things down, you still need to write that down. Okay? Satan, Satan knows <laughs> that where there is no peace, there is also no victory. So if you and I, <clears throat> excuse me, if you and I hope to have any foundation if we hope to have any stability at all, we've got to do what the Apostle Paul says here under the direction of the Holy Spirit of God. We've got to have our feet shod. What does the word shod mean? It means to be covered, to be fitted, to have something strapped on with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now, remember Paul's example here. Paul is in prison, and Paul sees these Roman soldiers on a continual basis. So his example is the Roman soldier in talking about the armor of God and, and most especially here in verse 14, the footwear that was a part of the uniform or the armor that the Roman soldier would wear. It was 
pronounced and it was particular. In other words, you could readily look at the feet and at the ankles and the legs of a particular individual and you could pick out just this quick that that person was a member of the Roman Legion. This thing was a rugged piece of footwear that was basically what I'll call half boot and half sandal. It had open sections around the, the leg and the ankle for ventilation. But the most telling and the most unique feature about this particular boot was the bottom of it. The bottom of the shoe where small protrusions called hobnails protruded from the bottom or from the soles of those shoes. Okay? These protrusions, these hobnails as they were called, protruded out the bottom of the shoe. Some of your football fans you know what it is for the, the, the football team to wear the football cleats. And if you will remember here in the last several weeks when games were being played in different places leading up to the Super Bowl, some of the fields were a little bit worse than others. And some of those teams got out there in the first half and they were slipping and sliding in all kinds of directions. And at halftime, they went in. And while they were resting up, the equipment managers changed the cleats on the bottoms of the shoes and made a larger or a longer cleat so that they would have a better grip of the field and hopefully would not slip and slide everywhere. That's the idea behind the hobnail here. <coughs> These nails would allow the Roman soldier to have traction <coughs> on slippery or frozen surfaces. It would allow the soldier to be able to stand upright and to be stable, though the ground around him might be frozen or it could be muddy or it could be slick. These hobnails would allow the soldier the ability to climb over rough terrain in pursuit of an enemy. Now there's a valuable lesson that needs to be learned here. Valuable lesson that we need to learn. You probably are already aware of the fact that sometimes life can be slick. Sometimes it can be muddy. Sometimes it can be frozen. And in many instances, regardless of what it is, it is very rough or difficult to traverse. We can slip. We can trip. We can fall. We can be, we can be pushed around and we can be pushed over. But when we have peace, when we have the peace that can only be found in God, and when that peace is anchored in our souls and in our lives, when it digs deeply into the, in, into the earth of our existence, it causes us to be able to stand upright regardless of how the hard the winds may blow and how bad the storm might be. You see, God's peace, God's peace gives you a firm grip that you need and must have in a world that is anything but firm. He gives you a grip in a world that seems to have no grip. God's peace gives you a stability when everything else around you seems to be unstable. God's peace will allow you to keep your footing when everything else around you is swirling like a whirlwind. God's peace will keep you sane in a world that is going insane. And peace, the peace of God, has some benefits that we see throughout the Bible. I want to call your attention to several this morning. And in order to do that, let me read from the book of Philippians, chapter 4, beginning with verse 6. Just listen. You can write this down and look at it later. Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. But here's what, again, the Apostle Paul says under the leadership of the Holy Spirit of God concerning one of the blessings and one of the benefits of peace. Listen. 
Be anxious for nothing. <laughs> But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. You see, one of the benefits of God's peace is that when it is locked into your life, <coughs> hear me, one of the benefits of God's peace when it is locked into your life is that it will be a guard and a protector for you. It'll stand like an armed soldier, like an armed sentinel, watching out over your life and mine. God's peace stands at attention, guarding the soul, guarding the mind, guarding the heart, keeping you and I stable and calm and at ease even when the world around us seems to be falling apart. Now think with me for a moment about shoes. Especially you ladies. The bottom line about shoes or the bottom line should be about shoes. Let me say that. The bottom line should be about shoes that no matter the style no matter the size and no matter the color, the ultimate goal of a shoe is to protect one's feet. Right? Now, I don't know about some of you ladies that walk like this. That's why I said maybe instead of saying the way it is, it's the way it should be. Okay, because I'm not sure how much protection it is when y'all are walking on your toes. Almost like ballerinas. But but that's a sermon for another day. And I, you know, we won't go there. So I'll just leave that. But protection of the feet, most especially the soles of the feet, is what shoes are designed for. <coughs> and it's the same goal with the peace of God. God's peace brings about an inner tranquility and a calmness of the soul. It is an anchor that keeps you tethered to sanctity or to sanity and sanctity too for that matter now that I think about it it is something that will keep you locked in that protects you and brings calmness to you in every circumstance and hear me God's peace is something that the world does not have it is something that the world does not give and it is something that the world does not understand. That's why at times when, when the world seems to be swirling around you and people are looking at you and they're thinking, how in the world is that man or that woman in control when it's obvious that everything around their life is out of control. How is it that they can be calm in the midst of the storm? I was going to play a song this morning and I, I couldn't get it to load. Maybe we'll do it one other Sunday. But there's a song, it's not new, but the gist of it is this. <laughs> it's talking about storm and it says sometimes he calms the storm but at other times he calms his child okay sometimes he'll take away the storm <coughs> sometimes he won't take away the storm <coughs> but in the times when he doesn't take away and to me this is even better than taking away the storm at times when, when he doesn't take away the storm, he'll wrap his arms around you and hold you and protect you and bring you through the storm. <clears throat> and while he's holding you, while he's embracing you, while he is pulling you close, He's also whispering in your ear. It's okay. It's okay. I got this. And more importantly, I 
got you. I got you. I think I may have told you the story before. If I, <coughs> if I have, please excuse me for being old and redundant. But years ago, when I was growing up, I did not know how to swim. And there was a swimming, swimming pool called Bolin's Swimming Pool, not too far from where I live. If you had drained all the water out of it, it would have looked somewhat like a snow cone cup. Okay? It was a round pool and it sloped inward like this. Okay? So the further you went out toward the center, the deeper the water got. Okay? Now, I'm out there, I don't remember how old I was, six, seven, eight, something along that line. And my dad took hold of me and said, I'm going to teach you today how to swim. And I thought, well, I, you know, I wanted to learn how. And so we were going out there, and he was holding on to me, and I had my arm, or my, my hands, actually locked on his arm. And we were walking out through there, and as we were going out toward the center, I could tell that not only was the water coming up this way on me, but I also could tell that it was getting to the point that where now, instead of me walking flat-footed, I was up on my toes. And then it got to the point to where I could barely touch my toes. <laughs> and I began to panic, and I looked at my dad, and I said, Dad, you can't take me out any farther. This is going to be over my head. And my dad looked back at me. Because I, I also said, I am holding on to you as best I can. <laughs> and I'll never forget, my dad looked over at me and smiled. And he said, son, it may be over your head, but it's not over mine. And while you may have hold of me, I've got hold of you. And I didn't bring you out here to let you drown. Now, I'm 61, and that happened to me when I was 7 or 8, so we're talking 53, 54 years ago. And I still remember that. So it made a dynamic impact upon my heart or I would have forgotten that a long time ago. I want you to understand, my dear friend, that you might feel like the storm is raging, the wind is blowing, the water is deep, and you are about to drown, but if he's got hold of you, he's still touching the bottom, and you don't have to worry about drowning. He didn't take you out there to drown. He took you out there to do one of two things. You can either swim through it or walk on top of it, but he's not going to let you drown in the middle of it. Hallelujah. Okay? It is the peace of God. The peace of God. That we need to know. <coughs> okay. My time's about gone. So let me let me pull this to a conclusion. In John 14, 27, Jesus said, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world gives do I give unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Okay? You, listen, you were given the peace of God the moment you became a child. Okay? He put His peace in you in the form of His Holy Spirit, which, who took up residence within your heart the moment that you were saved. So here's what I want you to understand. The peace of God has been applied to your heart and to your life. Okay? So what you and I have got to learn to do is not apply the peace of God. It's already been applied. What you and I have got to learn how to do is to appropriate and activate that which we've already been given. You don't have to go looking for it if you're a child of God. You already have it. You just need to learn how to appropriate it and how to activate it, how to put it in practice. 
That's why we go back to Philippians chapter 4. That's why Paul said, don't be anxious for anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. In other words, the Lord is saying, come and make your request made known unto me. But while you're doing that, while you're bringing your request to me, make sure that you pepper your prayers with thanksgiving. And then he says, and when you're thankful to me, verse 7, he says it will activate. Because verse 7 says the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, which surpasses any comprehension problems that you may have, will surround your heart, will guard, will take up a, like, build a fence around your heart and your mind and will guard you and protect you through Christ Jesus. So here's the progression. Get this and we're through. Here's the progression. Thanksgiving <coughs> activates peace. Okay? Thanksgiving activates peace. Here's the spiritual equation. Trust fuels thanksgiving. And thanksgiving activates peace. See, we've already talked about the, <coughs> the, the, uh, the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness. We've already talked about the trust issue. So the idea is trust fuels thanksgiving and thanksgiving then activates peace. What I'm telling you, and what God is telling you is, to continue to bring your requests before Him. Continue to bring your petitions before Almighty God. But hear me, any and every time you begin to feel worry and anxiety in your heart welling up inside of you, that's your cue to be thankful. You hear me? Any time you begin to be worried or fretful, or anxious about something, it's like God saying, time to be thankful. Time to be thankful. Here, here's the thing, and I, and I promise I'm through. You need to take all of the energy that you would have gathered and put into that waste basket of worry and transfer it over into a testimony of thanksgiving of who He is and whose you are and what He's done for you in the past, and be thankful. And hear me. Hear me. I don't care what's happened in your life. I don't care what might be happening in your life right now. There's not a one of us in this room, there's not a one of us watching on YouTube who does not have something to be thankful for. Amen. Amen. All of us. So don't let the enemy cheat you out of the peace of God. That peace that passes understanding. That, that, that peace that that you might not be able to truly, rightfully explain. But you just know that when you got it, you got it. And it will bring you through even the most difficult of circumstances. You remember the poem? I don't have it in front of me. But the poem about the footprints in the sand? And the guy questioning the Lord and saying, "Why is it that every time, <coughs> why is it every time the storms brew up, a uh, uh, brewed up, or whenever the, the way got difficult, why is it that I only see one set of footprints? Why is it that you left me, that you walked away from me, that you basically disowned me during those times?" And the Lord said, "No, son, you don't understand at all. That's not your footprints. Those are mine." Because it's in those most difficult times when you didn't walk with me, I picked you up and carried you. I 
picks you up and carries you. Sometimes he'll calm the storm. Other times he'll just calm you. But the peace of God that surpasses any and all understanding. Paul says, will keep. That's a, that's a positive thing like a while ago. We'll have tribulation. He says, we'll keep and guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And that's a promise you can take not only to the bank, but all the way to the grave. His peace never fails. Never fails. Let's pray. Father, I pray that your peace is active and present in our hearts and in our minds today. There's not a one of us in here, Lord, that is immune to storms. I was thinking about, even while I was preaching a minute ago, I was thinking about Seth having the flu. How I and probably other people in this room have had a flu vaccine in order to not contract the flu. But Father, there's not a vaccine that we can take that will keep us immune from storms. They'll chase us down. They'll find us even in our most private hiding places. But Father, what we need to do is not worry about the storms. We don't need to keep our vision down on the storms. We need to be like that eagle. Because once again, that eagle not only soars to higher heights, but that eagle casts his eyes to a higher plane, to a higher focus. He doesn't look at the storm. He looks at that which is above the storm. And we must do that too. <clears throat> Father, have your will away in our hearts as we come to this time of invitation and decision. Speak to any and all of us who need to be spoken to. And Father, help us not to be ashamed if we need to come to this altar and to confess that we, we have worried or that we're anxious or that we're concerned and that we need you to establish a bulkhead of peace in our hearts and in our lives this night. May your will be accomplished and may we follow and be obedient to your leading. For we pray in the name of Christ our Savior. Amen. Our hymn is number 238. Breathe on me. God has spoken to your heart today and you need to come for whatever the reason this altar is open. I would just invite you to be, again, obedient to Him and allow Him to have His will and way. 238, would you stand with me, please, as we stand.